uh, in Mongo Bay. It's an online resource. If you ha are in Cambodia and are unaware of the risk that you have, um, in Cambodia, it's very difficult to separate good and bad wood sources. Um, there is little legal enforcement of existing rules and little government support for sustainable options, such as improving the supply chains of alternative fuels. Um, and all of this gets international coverage and gets international brands to be uh, concerned about this. So it's something that is at least on H&M Group's mind and is on a few other brands as well that I'm aware of. So, um, however, there are a few solutions um, and hopefully this video will work. Did you know that the energy used in producing clothing is fashion's biggest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions? This energy has traditionally come from coal, gas and biomass such as wood to shift to more sustainable sources of energy and better protect our stressed planet, we need to utilize new tools in supply chains. In Cambodia, WWF and H&M Group have worked with partner Forest AI to develop technology that can contribute to reducing the pressures on natural forests. Using artificial intelligence, we can now quickly identify wood species and further support supplying factories with only sourcing biomass approved by H&M Group. Now, wood species can be identified from a photo, helping factories to verify that the wood they source is from residues of plantation species like mango and cashew, which are less likely to contribute to deforestation. Alongside additional efforts needed in Cambodia to responsibly manage plantations and forests, technology like this Wood AI app can play an important role in helping forest ecosystems stay healthy and continue storing CO2 key step in keeping global temperature rise below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Reaching net carbon neutrality by 2030 is core to H&M Group's focus for the next decade. And innovations that help keep unsustainable wood out of clothing production are just some of the steps. By providing factories with the technology to make better decisions, we can contribute to reducing the pressures on natural forests so they can continue to protect rich biodiversity and a stable global climate. The, the reason for this was to show that, you know, that in the Cambodian context, the ability to differentiate to tell the difference between good wood that is from a plantation that is not directly linked to deforestation versus the other woods that are available. And, and to highlight how H&M is working on this topic, you know, all factories in the short term, so up until 2025, all factories with boilers must use the app that I just showed so that they can uh, only let into the factory wood that is pre-approved, maybe a mango, cashew, rubber, acacia, and tamarind, anything from a plantation. Um, and also, you know, being supported to ideally start using rice husk waste with their boilers. And the medium term strategy for Cambodia, uh, as well as, you know, all other markets would be no wood of any type would be allowed um, in order to protect against the risk of deforestation, only rice, cashew, coconut, and other agricultural waste. And again, ideally, electric boilers and heat pumps uh, for all steam generation. And this is easier in the Cambodian context because almost all steam is used uh, for ironing processes and not for fabric production and dyeing. So um, other countries uh, will have different challenges if they currently are using wood-based biomass. And just to give one example uh, of a solution that is feasible today to replace any form of uh, burning something <laughs> to generate steam, uh, if you use solar water preheating, so using the power of the sun to get your water up to, you know, up to 90 degrees, you can be, support this with an electric boiler if you need to. Heat pumps to get the water up to 110. Uh, and then a flash tank to get the steam pressure to what you need. Uh, this, therefore, is a solution 
that doesn't need anything to be burnt uh, to generate enough steam for ironing for a tier one system. Um, so it's not a future technology. It is already available at uh, scale in markets today. And so in summary, um, brands are increasingly serious on CO2 reductions uh, through the science-based targets, but also in actual action. If you are a supplier who is not working on these topics yet today, uh, you are risking losing some of your clients that you currently have, and you will find it harder to attract other brands. Um, on the opposite side, if you are already active on your carbon reduction, you should find it much easier to attract uh, more progressive brands and hopefully higher paying brands uh, to meet your needs as well. Uh, biomass is not a long-term solution for the garment sector, uh, but it is useful today in certain contexts and in certain countries. Electrification is key to allow the garment sector to decarbonize uh, as it needs to. Uh, energy efficiency might not be an exciting topic for many, but it is where we are seeing huge energy savings, financial savings uh, today. And there's a lot more work that most uh, factories that I visited uh, can do on this topic. Uh, and finding ways to remove the need for steam at all is going to be where the biggest impact is in the medium to long term uh, and allow an industry that is you know, contributes potentially 5% of all global carbon emissions uh, really allow us to hit our targets and see the garment sector not be the perennial bad guy that it currently is. So thank you very much. Sorry, I forgot to unveil myself. <laughs> thank you, Pete, for sharing with us uh, H&M H&M's uh, perspective and also explain us the details that H&M has with the suppliers on some collaborations. And it's true, besides finding alternative sustainable energy source, sometimes thinking of uh, some innovation in our production process can also help us to reach the goal, like the water is dying. Um, if anyone have any questions for Pete, please put in the chat box. I saw some questions coming in already. We will come to those questions in a short while. Uh, now, if we can, let's look at the feedbacks to the questions we ask uh, everyone before the section, shall we? In case people haven't seen those questions, just quickly put the link on the chat box. So, first question, how do you get information on new technology? So, Pete. Yes, yeah, sorry, please. just trying to read. It's a little bit blurry Smaller. for me on my screen. Um, how do you so, feel about the answers? So, most of you are saying from the internet. I can see that, which is great. Um, I'd be very curious to know which sources you're using. Is it the GIZ resource? Uh, is it simply in Google and seeing what comes up? Um, then we've what's got the, from... What yeah, what's the second one, the blue I color? I can't read it. I have no idea. What does it say? From my something. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I can't read this. <laughs> wait, wait a second. I think it's it should be from my stuff. So the second, uh, oh, sorry, it's either from my so associations, either from okay. my stuff. I believe it's from uh, okay. associations. So from yeah. my associations, and that's great. It's nice to see the associations are providing the resources that you need. Um, hopefully, that is all of the associations across the region. Um, we don't know which of you answered this question. Um, but they should be a very valuable resource for you. Please ask them questions on these topics. Um, they will have opinions. They should be able to find you um, suppliers and understand what your uh, you know, other members 
are doing. So very useful. From your staff, okay? Not, not, no one's asking the staff, or are you just using the internet yourself? Uh, <laughs> that's good to know. And then from GIZ as well, you know, they so are a useful resource for all of us. Um, please ask them lots of questions as well. I know they love receiving questions. Uh, thank you. I believe GIZ does like, so the first one, so the highest number of answers is from internet. People get information from internet. Mm -hmm. Second biggest channel is from associations. And the third one is from GIZ seminars. I think it's a great news for GIZ. And the last one is from staff. So that's really interesting. And I think Peter, you also asked a second question, right? If we can look mm. at it. So the second question is, what could be the reasons to stop suppliers taking initiatives in decarbonization? Okay. So we've got an interesting mix of answers here. Again, I can't really read the answers, but I can see the colors. Uh, <laughs> It's true. I can. Okay. I think we have options like uh, lacking access to financing, don't mm -hmm. want to take a debt, uh, or long term and big investment yet reward not promising. Mm -hmm. The last one is lacking commitment from their clients. Ah, okay. Interesting. So, what is very interesting to me is that the second option, which received zero votes, is the one answer I hear the most from suppliers when they are talking right now about their decarbonization actions. Um, with the cost of borrowing being quite high um, and with you know interest rates being high, especially in markets such as Turkey, um, I'm often hearing that not wishing to take on debt today uh, is is the number one reason for not wanting to act. Um, and again, I'm surprised, uh, therefore, by the number of you with, who've answered in red, um, given you know the, the costs or the, the not seeing savings from your investments. I mean, if there are dramatic savings that can be made right now uh, as our internal programs uh, are showing. Um, often an ROI of less than a year, uh, the average is two years. So, you know, if that is a, a rooftop solar project, I mean, that's going to be more like five year ROI. That is 15 years of free electricity I, and um, for changing boilers. Um, maybe that is where you don't see a cost saving, but for all energy efficiency projects, there are dramatic savings. If you can combine those together into a multi-action strategy, again, slightly surprised there. Um, lacking commitment from clients, yes, that is where my uh, compatriots in other brands uh, <laughs> would be great to see longer commitments, whether that is longer order placements, you know, up to five years rather than season by season um, or in other such commitments would help remove the risk for you guys as suppliers. Um, and see the impact that we need to see. Um, a lack of access to financing. Again, thankfully, if you work with H&M Group, that is not an issue. <laughs> if you work with any other brand, uh, no, um, you know, there's an area where other brands are looking to improve and increase uh, the work that they can do, whether that is directly, like H&M style, we're directly supporting, or whether it's through organizations such as AII and their fashion fund, um, and other projects. So um, interesting to have this data. Thank you for your answers. It's really interesting, Peter, I think. Uh, if we can, sorry, if we can put back that uh, Mentimeter feedback screen. Uh, I think, Pete, it may be out of your surprise, maybe out of your expectation to see people who vote most is the, sorry, is the red color, which is long-term and big investment yet reward not promising, but maybe not that surprising. As for suppliers, we understand their concerns. And for me, what out of my surprise, uh, out of my expectation is people vote also, no one vote or very little people vote for don't want to take a debt. I think that's where H&M's policy can kick in, providing low interest loan. And... Yeah. 
maybe other brands or retailers, other clients could also take some uh, inspiration from that. So, um, oh, it's interesting. Very interesting to see these. So, thank you again. Again, I, um, I, I, yeah, <laughs> very surprised to see how many of you don't think uh, decarbonization investments uh, bring a promising financial return at the moment. Um, but yeah. also good to, good to know the mood in the room here. So good to know. Thank you. <laughs> yes, it's very it's very helpful. It's very inspiring. Uh, so thank you, Peter, again for the sharing. And I saw some questions come in. I will, we will come back to the questions in a short while. Um, same as uh, Pete Francesco, or the other speaker, also prepared an open question and very curious to know your response. If we can, we will use the same tour Mentimeter for that. Let's just give a minute to load the screen. Okay, we will come back to, I'm very curious to the feedbacks of this question. So as Pete mentioned in his uh, section, that biomass is definitely a much better sustainable energy source in the garment factory, but it has two drawbacks. One is biomass, burning biomass would still release some CO2 emissions. And the second is it has a risk of deforestation, especially in a country like uh, Cambodia. So decarbonization coming along with uh, deforestation coming along with uh, def uh, decarbonization is probably a very big challenge in Cambodia. So today, that's why we have Francesco here to share su share some ideas on what we could do to manage this risk of deforestation. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, thank you also, Peter, for uh, giving us an overview of H&M, uh, uh, let's say, roadmap for decarbonization. Uh, it's also interesting for, for us uh, to see what you guys are doing. Uh, uh, let me share my screen. Okay. You should be able to see a uh, big uh, stack of <laughs> wood residues. Uh, give me a sign if you can see it now, Jesse. That's yes, it. perfect. We can see. Um, okay, uh, thank you again. Um, I'm here to uh, present you and tell you about what we are doing in Cambodia. Uh, I know that in the room there are many that are not in Cambodia. Uh, nevertheless, please um, bear in mind that there are always commonalities and things in common uh, in uh, countries. Uh, so, and I will also uh, try to highlight uh, what are these. Um, so, and also after doing the Q and A, please do let me know if you have any specific question. Uh, if I can answer related to uh, your specific country. Uh, as Peter was saying, uh, biomass is not always all the same um, and uh, things are uh, getting also stricter and stricter on what type of biomass uh, suppliers uh, are using. Uh, in countries as uh, Cambodia, uh, biomass is uh, widely available uh, and uh, is still the main source of energy uh, in the, let's say, energy mix of the supplier of the factories. Uh, about 90% of the energy, in, in fact, is uh, uh, generated from biomass sources, by wood specifically, and only 10% is uh, coming from electricity. Um, while, uh, ironically, the energy bill is exact, exactly the opposite. Actually, uh, about 20% of uh, the energy bill comes from electric electricity, and uh, only 20 comes from the cost of the wood of the biomass they're using. Uh, 
Today I'm presenting you this project uh, that we called Woodchain that we will start in September this year, so in a, in a month or so. Uh, it is a project supported by GIZ and also co-financed uh, from uh, some brands. Uh, and it will also involve some of you maybe in the room, uh, some of the, I'm talking to the suppliers uh, in the room. Uh, because uh, as the name of the project says is uh, wood chain so obviously this refers to the supply chain uh, of the sustainable wood in the garment industry uh, what are we going to do uh, i will tell you in a few seconds uh, basically is a reporting system for sustainable wood uh, as the subtitle here mentions uh, and how does this work? Uh, basically, uh, as we were saying, uh, biomass is not always the same. And uh, also the industry index uh, indexes, uh, among them the most famous one is the HIG, or is one of the most uh, used by the industry. Uh, from November 2020, 2023, uh, we'll uh, ask more questions about what is the biomass suppliers are going to use or are using. In particular, there is a, few, a full new chapter into the energy and uh, greenhouse gas emissions assessment of the suppliers related to the source of the biomass. Uh, and the HIG index is asking factories or suppliers to source their biomass from certified plantations. Now, this is a very uh, strict, I would say, uh, requirement. Nevertheless, very uh, also is, I understand from their point of view, is the safest uh, because having a uh, certified plantation means being sure the plantation uh, indoors and implements sustainable practices. Uh, nevertheless, in countries like in Cambo like Cambodia, there are very few uh, certified plantations where uh, suppliers can regularly uh, supply the uh, need of biomass of wood. Um, hence. Uh, things get a little bit complicated, especially for considering that, again, almost, uh, if not everyone, almost uh, uh, are using wood today uh, to go uh, greener and to reduce then greenhouse gas emissions uh, still using biomass. So we wanted to work in this direction, giving you in the room and uh, brands as well a tool to uh, in, for the short term, so from September, to keep using uh, biomass, but sustainable and being able to prove that it, it's sustainability. So that to being able to prove that it's sustainable, even though there is not necessarily a certification um, plant, certified plantation in your country yet, or not many. A second uh, reason why we are doing this, this has to do uh, a lot with the uh, background uh, conditions of Cambodia, which is a country where there is a lot of sustainable biomass. Uh, sustainable biomass, again, I'm referring to agricultural waste of plantations, uh, specifically like cashew nuts, uh, wood residues, uh, rubber wood residues, uh, and this residues, this, uh, this wood, um, will be even more available in the coming years. We have found out from a study that was uh, conducted together with GRS and the Forest AI uh, that basically, uh, since uh, cashew nut and rubber plantations are harvested every 20, 30 years, uh, and since in the uh, in the uh, 90s, basically there was a boom in, in Cambodia in uh, land concession and plantations uh, of uh, again of this uh, this uh, species. Uh, basically, in the coming years, there is going to be a lot 
of uh, of wood residues um, that are go going to be beyond the uh, need, the demand that currently the uh, market has, which is we are talking about seven hundred thousand cubic meter per year of wood. Already today, we are close to that in uh, in Cambodia in terms of availability of wood. Uh, so again, we are basically they are, this project aims, if you want to put it in another way, to use the resources that we do have in Cambodia, um, and uh, and so and but just making sure that this uh, then uh, can be proven to be sustainable. Uh, in fact, this is another topic that we have uh, found out, and I'm referring to the first point here, that from an audit we have conducted to more than 40 factories in Cambodia, they actually have, they already use uh, about 20% of the wood that they use is sustainable or coming from uh, uh, basically agricultural uh, plantations and uh, uh, it's agricultural residues, but they cannot really prove it. What do I mean? They cannot really prove it. They can prove it by themselves because they know where they bought it. Uh, they can also uh, scan it, for example, using the app that Peter showed the uh, Wood AI. Nevertheless, this is not a certification accepted by the industry index, by the HIG index. Uh, so we wanted to give. Uh, uh, like an additional tool, uh, giving a step forward, basically to allow them to use sustainable wood, and again to be not only use it but to prove that it's sustainable. That is the key. Um, as it was mentioned before, uh, how how can uh, then basically brands and factories and suppliers meet their environmental targets? Uh, there are several several technologies available today uh, each of them has pro and cons uh, um, peter has mentioned already a few of them uh, basically investing in boilers we have found out also that often uh, factories don't own the facilities and sometimes are real in cambodia i'm talking about so i don't know in other countries you can tell me later if this applies also to you but uh, since they don't own the facility, sometimes they are reluctant in long-term investments. This is something that can be addressed as well with uh, financial mechanism, I guess. Uh, switching to electric boilers also uh, has some pro, obviously, but also some cons, meaning uh, specifically related specifically to the energy mix of the country. Uh, so in Cambodia, where the energy mix is quite actually uh, almost 50% renewable energy, uh, it's quite good compared to other countries. Uh, but again, it means that with an electric boiler, when 50% of the electricity you use basically doesn't come from renewable energy. Let's not forget that basically electricity doesn't ensure sustainability if it's not coming from renewables, right? Or unless you have, again, like a solar panel on your rooftop. Um, so we wanted to focus on, again, on this. Uh, another reason why we wanted to use the resources that we have in Cambodia, uh, the availability of sustainable wood. But again, uh, you, while I, I'm telling you this, I'm sure you have in your mind many uh, questions. Say, yeah, but how can factories, how can we really source uh, in a reliable way sustainable wood because we need it every day it's not that we need it sometimes yes sometimes not how can we uh, prove the sustainability of the wood uh, we have no uh, certified plantations in our country uh, so basically regardless of where i buy the wood it's going to be complicated uh, to me to demonstrate to third parties its sustainability and more importantly uh, it's hard and this I know it work, I've been having been working in the uh, wood supply chain for more than uh, 10 years that um, controlling controlling the, the supply chain of the wood 
in order to progressively use more sustainable wood is uh, very complex because it uh, encompasses different actors uh, which increase the let's say the degree of complexity of the overall uh, sustainable practice so what we want to do with wood chain is basically and finally we get we are, i'm getting to the point but sorry i wanted to give you some background uh, we want to develop our reporting system we call it so far a reporting system for sustainable wood uh, that would allow uh, brands and factories so its suppliers to first of all um, be able to report to the HIG index under the um, biomass uh, chapter uh, in, or in order to get the points related to the HIG index uh, having uh, basically a proof of the sustainability of the biomass that they are using. Secondly uh, but not less important, giving, let's say, giving the possibility to uh, suppliers to increase and monitor the percentage of sustainable wood that they're using. So let's say today uh, you realize you are using 20% uh, of wood coming from cashew nut plantation. Uh, you don't, today you don't have a way to actively um, control and increase this amount, uh, especially in, because you, there are you, there are not always reliable sources of uh, of this type of uh, agricultural residues. Um, so this tool will allow you to do exactly that. Uh, how does how does this work? Basically, to make a comparison. What we are aiming at in the midterm is uh, a little bit um, uh, food delivery app, but for wood. So uh, instead of uh, having a restaurant and a delivery, uh, a delivery guy, and then the end customer placing the order of the yeah, of the food, there will be something similar, but for the wood. So uh, like this application work. Uh, Basically, the wood chain uh, platform will uh, identify uh, wood sources that are sustainable. Uh, so that we, we will define together with forestry experts what are the criteria that uh, tell this plantation can be or this source can be considered uh, sustainable or not. Then all the actors of the supply chain will also be verified. Uh, this will involve also middlemen or wholesalers of wood uh, that most of the time basically are uh, one of the main reasons why it's difficult to understand where the wood comes from because uh, these uh, wholesalers tend to uh, get wood from multiple sources store them in a warehouse and then uh, selling them to uh, suppliers uh, without necessarily uh, knowing or, uh, exactly where it was coming from. Uh, and of course, uh, this application will allow um, to trace all the transactions uh, that are happening on the, on the platform. So from the wood source or from the plantations, uh, to the wholesaler till the factories and brands uh, that want to uh, participate in this will have access to uh, all these numbers so it can really quantify uh, the amount of wood of sustainable wood their suppliers have been using uh, so that will have uh, the very uh, wanted uh, chain of custody, uh, how is it called, of the wood uh, the supply chain is using. Um, in the, um, so what does this mean in the short term, in the middle term? Um, in the short term, um, basically, this project will lead to, as I mentioned, a reporting system first, that basically will produce all the documentation 
not yeah not it, it, w it will not be an app yet but for the first year we will pro we will produce a reporting system that will give factories and uh, brands all the documentation required by the HIG index to prove the source of the biomass sustainable uh, and of course they will be uh, that th this will allow them then to cut then uh, their greenhouse gas emissions uh, and then in the in a couple of years um, so in the midterm uh, all this will be finally digitalized um, which will allow to uh, two main basically benefit, yeah, benefits. First of all, it will uh, ease the administrative burden for uh, the factories, for the suppliers, for you basically in the room uh, that will have to deal with less, less paperwork basically to prove where the wood was coming from. Uh, and most, more importantly, also it will allow the system to be uh, implemented also in other countries. One of the main advantages of uh, digital of the digit of digitalizing uh, processes and procedures is often this also right. So something that you can also uh, apply easily or more easily to other countries. Uh, then uh, simultaneously, what we are aiming at basically uh, once all this infrastructure will be in place is to develop a country-specific certification, uh, so uh, something that really certify the biomass sources specifically for each country. Because once um, you have the chain of custody of the wood, basically uh, you need the involvement of an um, uh, accreditation body that typically is um, a governmental institution, could be the Ministry of Environment or Forestry Agency of the country to basically uh, uh, define what are the rules of the certification and then also an, an accreditation body to uh, conduct the audits uh, and give the uh, so wanted certification. Um, that's it from my side. So uh, it was a brief uh, overview of what we are going to work in the coming years. Uh, again, I wanted to highlight that uh, biomass is not always good. Uh, biomass only when it's sustainable is carbon neutral because uh, it's replanted. And so the, the, the new trees will absorb the CO2 that has been emitted by uh, those that has been burned. Uh, but if not, if it's not replanted, then it's definitely not sustainable. So uh, it's uh, important to bear it in mind. This, uh, if you don't use sustainable biomass, this will have uh, impact on the greenhouse gas emissions uh, of your supply chain. Um, if you're interested in uh, knowing more and also if you're interested in uh, participating in this project that is starting uh, in the coming months, uh, please do reach out to me. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'm uh, available. I will try to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francesco, for sharing the project uh, wood chain. Uh, yeah, wood chain. I uh, saw so we have quite a heated up discussions in the chat box about biomass and everything. We will come back to those questions in a short while. And now, if we are ready, I'm curious to see the feedbacks on our uh, Mentimeter questions that Francesco asked before the section. So the question is, would you like to use more plantation wood in the boilers, rubber, cashew, cassava, essential, to reduce carbon emission? We have the four options we have. I can read the options now. Oh, I think the letters are still a bit too... So basically the four options, one is yes, but don't know how to get a reliable supply. Another one, no, too much hassle with uh, logistics, storage, loading process. 
Another one, no, I would rather use uh, rice husk or pellet. The last one, yes, but only if the price per kilowatt is competitive with traditional wood. So those are the four answers. Interesting. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm uh, I'm trying to get close to to my screen to get a better view um, of the not a better but have a view of the answer. Uh, it looks pretty homogeneous, uh, so it um, uh, looks like everything is quite pertinent uh, to what I was expecting. Um, I can tell that basically we will be uh, addressing each of these issues um, with with our approach uh, in, in in our project. Um, especially the first, uh, when we are talking about the, the blue one, where we are talking about a reliable source of biomass, this uh, is, some, is really something we are prioritizing in our project because we know without that, that you can be uh, as sustainable as you want, but still you need quantities, you need volumes. Uh, the red one, sorry, Jesse, can you tell me what... Uh, ah, yeah, they, they would prefer rice husk briquettes or pellets. That's uh, also super uh, if you can uh, find them uh, in your country uh, and you can deal with all that entails, that's super. We are not jealous. Uh, we don't want to impose uh, wood residues to anyone. Uh, so whatever you think works best for you, that's great. The yellow one is yes, but uh, only if... Sorry, I cannot see. Yes, but only if the price per kilowatt is ah, competitive yeah. with traditional wood. Yeah. Yes, this one, uh, the good news is that it is. Um, basically, especially cashew wood and rubber wood uh, are in Cambodia, at least. I'm talking about Cambodia. I don't know prices in other countries, but given the over availability of these residues, in the last 10 years, the, to give you an idea, the price of cashew nut didn't change. So this tells also, first of all, how much it is available and unused um, and also is uh, cheaper, way cheaper uh, than unknown wood or uh, yeah, mixed wood um, and per, per cubic meter. Per kilowatt hour, we are really talking about cents. Uh, so given the fact that that uh, suppliers, uh, the bill that suppliers uh, have is uh, represented for 80% by the electricity bill. Uh, this is very, uh, becomes neglectable basically because the, if the, um, the cost for biomass increases a little bit, become, goes from 20% of, of the energy bill maybe to 21%. So it's not going to be uh, life-changing, but it will be life-changing in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions. Thank you, Francesco. Thank you for your sharing on the feedbacks. It's quite interesting, especially when people answered the preferred uh, rice husk. I think everyone is quite aware about the risk of deforestation. And, and that's why the wood, wood chain can be a very good tool when, when we still didn't build up a reliable supply for the, of the rice husk. Uh, I saw some uh, very interesting questions in the chat box. So I see we have a little bit more time. So we can have maybe more than one questions. And I think this question is probably for you, Francesco. Uh, someone is asking, what kind of certifications are available for bio -briquids? Well, the good news for uh, briquettes, when you are using briquettes, uh, I think f the question uh, referring to bio briquettes, I guess, is talk uh, the person is talking about rice house briquettes or agricultural, uh, let's say, residues made briquettes. The good news is that typically you don't need certifications for that because uh, any agricultural residues um, is by default uh, sustainable because it is a waste that would have no other use um, 
so you are not actually uh, adding any uh, CO2 to the world. Um, uh, so yeah, the good news is that when you when you have something that clearly is not a cause of deforestation, such as ri a rice husk briquette or a, uh, depends where the pellet stamp is made from, uh, then basically you don't need a certification. Where, when is that you need a certification? When there is wood involved. So, uh, because wood uh, could also come from forests, from natural forests, right? So, which are a carbon sink for the world. Um, and we want to keep them where they are. Actually, we want to try to uh, grow them as much as, or regrow them as much as possible. So usually you do need a, a certification for the source of the wood if you are using wood to make pellets, for example, to make briquettes. But usually this is not a common practice. Briquettes uh, are typically made of uh, wastes, agricultural wastes, so it shouldn't apply to you. Thank you, Francesco. Uh, before I go on, before I go on with uh, more questions, just want to remind everyone that we will put a link in the chat box. It's a feedback link to this seminar. We appreciate if uh, if everyone take a look and give us some uh, rate and also feedbacks and comments. It will help us a lot. So for the questions. I saw more questions coming in, and I think, Pete, that uh, is for you. I will put those questions together. For instance, I have a question. Why H&M developed Wood AI if H&M believes that biomass is not the future and should be stopped? Another similar question. Hi, I just joined and read a line from Pete's presentation where it said, Biomass cannot be counted as a long-term solution for energy. Please, can you elaborate? Sure. Thank you, uh, Jesse. Thanks for both of those questions. Um, and I just wanted to say thanks to Francesco for the great uh, presentation there and uh, lots of more information for everyone in the room on all of the biomass solutions in Cambodia and regionally. Um, to answer the first question, you know, the, it took a, two years to... Uh, get the the wood app uh, to be used uh, in this current form. So over that time, uh, knowledge and understanding of biomass as a fuel has developed and changed. Um, also, uh, it's, it's, the app is still very important. If you read those news articles that I shared, and as you heard from Francesco as well, um, the risk of deforestation in Cambodia is real today. Uh, so any option that we can have today to reduce that risk uh, is of huge value, even if uh, that solution is only valuable for, for a few years, it is still real. So um, helping our suppliers ensure that there's no deforested wood uh, in their boilers um, has, has value today, even if all wood is something we're looking at stopping in the next few years. Um, and the second question, let me just find it um, again, because it was a long question. Um, one second. So um, I we do not see biomass as a long-term solution for energy. There are uh, uh, carbon and dust and other pollutants emitted uh, when biomass is burned, no matter what source of biomass. Um, as technology improves as factories become more efficient and as access to renewable electricity improves there are therefore solutions for generating steam and generating hot water that don't require burning things so that is obviously uh, the best long-term or medium-term solution um, and so yeah um, waste products from agriculture um, are counted as carbon neutral by the garment sector today because they are waste, they can be regenerated. It is seen, whether that is accurate or not, as something that is circular. Um, I think more and more data is showing there are risks 
uh, in this model. If you look at Europe, uh, the UK, um, the Drax power station is burning wood chips shipped from Canada uh, to the UK where it's burnt. Uh, that does not strike me as a great long-term solution to the climate crisis. Um, so at the factory level uh, where we can control things, um, I think burning of anything uh, should be a last resort uh, once such things as heat pumps, electric boilers um, are much more widely available in countries uh, where production happens. So whether that is Bangladesh or Pakistan or Cambodia. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question, AG. Thank you, Pete, for sharing your thoughts and the long-term goals and perspective on the biomass topic, which is true. I think today, on general level, we made a bigger picture of the country context, which is also true that if you could have electricity from renewable energy, as I said, electricity doesn't necessarily mean clean energy, unless you know it's from renewable energy. But if you are sure, if you have on-site solar panels or other means of renewable energy, electricity is definitely much better than biomass. However, for some countries, especially countries who have lots of byproducts from agriculture, biomass, at least in the current stage, is still a alternative sustainable energy sources than core or fossil fuel. I think that's very clear for everyone. So I think that's also why biomass is uh, using biomass, burn biomass in boilers is still a quite good option, at least for now. And that's why we also have Francesco to share with us how can we make sure that biomass, the effort we put in biomass, not get involved into deforestation. So I think... Um, I'm concerning. There's a few questions. AG has responded back to my comments, Jesse. Um, right. Uh, with, with Pakistan context. Uh, so I can quickly answer. That's okay. Um, yes, sure. the available electricity in the grid in Pakistan is currently not very renewable, um, but that is improving on a daily basis. Um, on site uh, solar panels. Um, have a payback period of five years uh, in almost all South Asian countries. So yes, there is a high investment initially, but within five years, you will start to see free energy uh, for the next 15 years. Um, also, some production in Pakistan happens in areas where wind power is, is becoming increasingly available. There is also uh, I'm aware of the development of biogas production for garment factories as well. So you can replace your natural gas uh, with biogas as an alternate option. Um, also, you know, working with the Net Zero Pakistan uh, organization, they are looking to generate IREC quality certificates. So if you're using electricity, there are ways that you can potentially uh, see improvements in the electricity you're using. So it is still possible uh, to find uh, renewable solutions for you in, in Pakistan. Um, pl please talk to your alliance in Pakistan or the Net Zero Pakistan team. I think they can help you out with some of these questions. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Pete, and thank you, our audience, uh, AG. Those are very interesting questions and very important questions and, and discussions. I hope uh, our future seminars can carry those discussions deeper to the level that how small and medium-sized suppliers can access the financing of decarbonization. Basically, when we are talking about on-site uh, solar panels or those natural gas, those kind of investment, as you said, Pete, it at least requires five years. And after, yes, you have free energy, but before that. So those access, those financing or those solutions, can that be accessed by small and medium size of suppliers? I hope our future seminars can carry on those interesting questions. But for now, I think it's interesting. We have some, uh, I'm considering of time. So uh, thank you, Pete, for sharing the perspective and practice on site of those um, elaborations with the suppliers, especially when we get stuck between 
electricity and biomass, we could also think about the innovative technology we could adopt in our production process, like waterless dye. So that really, I hope that's really insightful and inspiring for everyone. And thank you for Francesco bringing us the technical solution about wood chain, and that would help any countries who get involved into biomass, but also want to move away from deforestation. So thank you very much for, thank you everyone for being here today with us. And hope to see you soon in the next seminar. Also, before we leave the meeting, thank you everyone to, I will put the link again, give us some feedback. Take you one minute, give us some feedback on the seminar. It will help us a lot. So thank you and have a good day and good evening.